Hello, dear friends from Spanish Libertarian. How are you doing? It's Ignacy here. We continue making interviews. We continue making interviews in English. Uh, you know, we have, to dis we have to do something with this boredom and this confinement, which is really hard. But I think we are going to have a good time talking today with a person that I've been recently introduced. Here we have with us Rob Duffy. He's a coach and also he's very involved or has been involved with the libertarian movement. And I think we can, we are going to have a good time. Uh, Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Ignacy. Thanks for in inviting me onto your show. Let's, let's have an interesting conversation and relieve some of the stress that people might be feeling out there. Exactly. That's the idea. We are living in a strange times and this is not fake. This sounds, this looks like a nightmare, but it's not. But I think that if we increase our awareness or we can, we only have fun or we can reflect, these are days for, for, for deep reflections, I think we can overcome it successfully. The first question that I always do to all my, all my guests is that if you can introduce yourself, who is Rob Duffy? What can you explain to us, at least from the professional side? And then we will continue uh, with some other questions. So when you want. Wow, that's a deep question, and yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much uh, detail you would like. But um, I suppose feel free. Do, do you want me to 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 like tell you my story about why I became a libertarian, why I got interested in the ideas of freedom? Let's let's dig in and let's see where the flow leads us. Sure. So, like, I don't mind getting super vulnerable. Um, like, I basically. When I left school, I hated school, to be honest. Uh, when I left school, I did one interview and I got the job. And that job was working for the government in the post office. Okay. And I really didn't like it. It was like so boring, horrible. Um, and at the time, I was sort of playing music. I was, thought I was a cool guy. And I was taking lots of drugs and stuff. Um, and then... Won a holiday, basically, over to Ibiza. You know where that is. Yeah. And I had a really good time. Bit of a too, too much of a good time. Uh, took lots of drugs, and I nearly killed myself. Basically, okay. I fell four stories off a balcony onto concrete, <laughs> and I smashed my arm, smashed my foot. My foot was, was hanging off. I don't remember anything because I was so out of my head. What? Um And basically, that changed my life. From that moment, I realized, well, after I had lots of operations, I realized mm -hmm. I wasn't doing anything interesting or good with my life. And I basically decided I'm going to find meaning and purpose in my life. Uh, how old were you when 21. that happened? 21. 21. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was uh, 2001. It was 13 days after 9-11. Um, because I was in an Ibiza town uh, hospital bed watching the aftermath of uh, the Americans going after Bin Laden. So that, that's, that's the kind of memories. But that was, I reflect upon that now as the best thing that ever happened to me because mm -hmm. that gave me perspective and it gave me a meaning to move towards in my life. And subsequently, I, I went back into education. I started studying psychology um, while remaining in that horrible, boring job. Mm -hmm. um, but I just spent all my time educating myself. And I obviously got myself into psychotherapy and processed a lot of the trauma that I experienced in my life. Um, and it really was the best thing that ever happened to me because that enabled me to really get familiar with the ideas of freedom and liberty. Mm -hmm. And I set up a group here in Ireland in 2010 um, where we started to discuss libertarian ideas. And that's where it all came from. I went to a conference in 2012. I met people like Wolf von Lehr um, and Fred Roder, Lucas Schweiger from SFL. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, this is, this is an interesting thing that's my going on here. <laughs> my guys, I found my tribe. And yeah, kept interested in it. And I left my old job in 2013 and I set my business up in 2014 and I became a life and business coach. Well, so I've nice. I, I, uh, this is a nice story. And also I love the fact that we dig 
uh, deep uh, <laughs> in the first minute. You you mentioned the concept that I think it's very important. Maybe it's the most important concept. You 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 talk about meaning. Let's mm. talk about meaning because um, it's very curious that you have to be in the worst uh, stage of your life in order to find meaning. Um, I don't know this call to action. Do you think that? We have to be in this kind of uh, horrendous situation no. in order to find it. Uh, also, you you work as a coach. Um, how do you help people to find their own meaning and path? Yeah, so this is exactly what I help people dive into in my program. Um, a lot of the time, you know, we go through life and we never really ask the deep questions. We never really ask, who am I? Yeah. <laughs> You know, because that's the most important and fundamental question about where people derive their meaning from. They never really ask, you know, who am I? What What are my values? What's important to me in the world? You know, because we, we have habits and routines and scripts and ways of being with each other. A lot of people avoid asking that question. And I say avoid, people might sort of resist me saying that they might avoid asking that question, but... Here's, here's a test for that. Ask somebody who they are and see how they react to that. See if they have an answer ready for you or see if they sort of have to sort of squirm mm. and get a little bit uncomfortable, which is usually the case. A lot of people are like a little bit unsure about who they are and they don't like the question. So that's, that's what I help people do. I help them really dig in deep, asking the deep questions about you know, who they are the good stuff and the bad stuff because mm -hmm. another thing that comes out <laughs> when, when I work deep with people is that people find that they are not one congruent personality. There's lots of parts of us. There's many elements of us. And this is a fact. There is many elements to Rob. There's many elements to you, you know, part of, I know part of you is a musician, right? Yeah. Part, a part of you is a podcast uh, host. Mm-hmm. So those are not those are not the same, right? There's there's many parts that overlap and cross over, mm -hmm. and when we t when we talk about the big meaning of who we are, all those parts come into play, and some of them are contradicting each other, and they go against each other, and we can have internal disputes with, with ourselves, and this is the same for everybody else. Everybody has internal conflicts and internal things that that don't align and and make us move forward as one but I, I don't know if i understand your point are you saying that these kind of contradictions are inherently bad i mean do we have to to be aligned in order to find that meaning that we were talking before well it really depends on the person like so for for you is there is there anything like if you want to if do you want to do play this out i can ask you a couple of questions as you want Cool. So is there anything that you find is a contradiction that that stops you from moving forward in your life? <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. I mean, we all have these uh, kind Absolutely. of yin-yang uh, personality and exactly. Uh, behaviors. Exactly. And the, the question for people to ask is, is this worth me doing anything about it? Because if, if we identify that there is something that is stopping us from moving forward in terms of, you know, pursuing a new goal or a new interest, we do have the power to change it, but it's mm -hmm. tough, right? Because we've got years and years of the backlog of us pushing against ourselves, basically. And to overcome that, we have to become hyper aware of where that came from and knowing what it is that triggers moving us in into that sort of sense of uh, that part of us mm -hmm. running on autopilot because it is autopilot Absolutely. and to become aware of those things takes us being very conscious and very focused on making a new pattern and a new script mm -hmm. and that's what i help people do it's it's how we relate to ourselves inside of our own heads because we're all talking to each, ourselves all the time yeah but sometimes it's just so automatic that we're not aware of what we're saying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And until we become aware of what we say to ourselves, uh, we can't move forward. 
Okay, well, this is very interesting, Rob. I, I'm. This is not the kind of interview that I usually do, but I, I love it because I think about this 24-7. Awesome. Um, another question uh, related with this topic. You're talking about this internal monologue that sometimes stops us. Is there any formula in order to to shut it down or to make it more efficient? What What are the kind of biases or traumas that you see amongst your clients? Well, I can't go into specifics because of confidentiality and whatnot, but um, uh -huh. in terms of a formula, this is the formula, and this isn't my formula, this is a formula that's very common in the coaching uh, space that helps people to increase their level of self-awareness and self-knowledge. Have you got mm -hmm. a pen? This might be interesting for you to take down. So it's if you, if you want to write this down on a piece of paper, I suggest that you write five lines going across and on the first line, write the letter C. C stands for circumstances. Do you want me to do it? Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> so C stands for circumstances. In life, we all have a set of circumstances. There's a, there's a set of circumstances right now for you. You're mm -hmm. sitting in a room in Barcelona. Uh, I can go out in the street. You can't go out in the street. These are all facts of, yeah. of where you find yourself right now. Mm -hmm. The next line is T. T stands for thoughts. So mm -hmm. because of those circumstances, you have a set of thoughts and interpretations about your situation. So you might view that as shit. <laughs> you mightn't like the fact that you can't go out, right? Yeah. But, but those thoughts are under your control. You don't have to think that it's a negative. You can view that as a positive. You can view that as an opportunity. And that is where our, our only power is to change how we view our circumstances. Because our thoughts create our F, our feelings. Mm -hmm. And we have a set of feelings about our thoughts. And if you're thinking that, oh, you know, I'm stuck indoors, I can't really do anything, you're going to feel a bit crappy about that. And mm -hmm. your sense of, of life is going to be a bit, a bit negative and you're going to be dull. Rather yeah. than if you view it as an opportunity, you can get excited and you can feel excited about it, mm -hmm. which is really what I encourage people uh, to do if they're feeling uh, negative about things. And out of those feelings, we have the actions that we take. So A stands for actions. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeling excited, you're going to take excited action. If you're feeling lethargic and a little bit drained and a little bit negative, you're not going to take so many actions, right? And all of those actions that you take leads to the results that you get. So the or uh, finally stands for results. The results that you get in your life are based upon all of the actions that you cumulatively take. Mm -hmm. So if you're not taking very many actions, you're not probably going to receive the results that you want in Absolutely. your life. So it all comes from your thinking. If your thoughts create the results that you get in your life. If you're having crappy, disempowering thoughts, you're not going to get very empowering results in your mm -hmm. life. So it's all about what is going on up here. That's why it's so important to manage what mm -hmm. you have in your mind. Absolutely. Well, I, I love talking about this because I think we, we don't talk enough about our feelings and, and thoughts and actions in, in society. Um, another question regarding this topic, I would like to talk about this triggering situation. So I don't want to go to Ibiza to almost kill myself. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> so uh, how can we, I don't know, change the reality or change ourselves in order to, to have a feeling that something has clicked in our mind and we don't have to be in this kind of uh, situations that you were involved when you were 21. Yeah. And like it literally doesn't take that, you know, to, yeah. to it doesn't take that sort of really negative moments to get you to, to realize mm -hmm. you can click your fingers right now and you can say, actually I'm changing my mind about this specific thing in my life. You know, I didn't have to have a really negative thing happen to me to, for me to reflect. It did take that in my life for me to, to have that reflection point. But you don't have to, you know, have something really bad happen. And it could be something that you just recognize, you know, I don't like the fact that I 
mightn't be in a relationship or I mightn't have the best relationships with some of my friends or some of my family or I mightn't have the things that I want. And it's the same thing, right? My my reflection point was to have that chaos land upon me mm-hmm. and to sort of say, I don't have any meaning in my life. I don't really have a purpose. But you can derive meaning and purpose through many different things. You don't need to have something really bad happen to you. And it just takes a shift in your mindset to say, mm-hmm. do you know what? I'm going to set myself a goal. And I would really recommend people set small little goals, not really big, huge goals straight away. Because when you create the ability for you to win in a small way and you increase it the next time, every win that you get, increase it, go bigger, go bigger, go bigger. Over time, you'll be achieving huge things. Like for you, right? I saw a video you posted the other day of you creating some instruments uh, I think that was back in 2013. Now you yeah. look at that, you look, you, you kind of laugh at that a little bit embarrassed, right? But that was probably a big thing for you to do back then. And you probably look at that and go, that was a bit silly. But <laughs> but for you now, you've done bigger things after that, right? Yeah, I hope. <laughs> yeah, of course. And and that's what it takes. You know, you as as we sort of learn and grow, we show our talents and then we we sort of revise and say, do you know what? I can do something better now. And now you're doing a podcast. You're interviewing people, right? Mm-hmm. Which is which is fantastic. You're probably reaching thousands of people. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but that's what it takes. It takes you to step out of your comfort zone once, get a little win, tell yourself, do you know what? I can do this. And give yourself that permission to go a little bit bigger the next time. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Um, th- thanks for your words, by the way. Um, uh, so let, to wrap it up, so you're having a program in where you teach this uh, coaching, so to speak. Um, can you explain more or less uh, how do you do it? And uh, maybe why it is uh, specifically important these days of coronavirus, because um, the circumstances, as you were mentioning before, are changing. So I think we have to change our thoughts, feelings, and actions and results. So uh, you can sell us more or less uh, your uh, product if you want. Sure. Like, you know, the, the program is generally for people who are introverts, sensitive, shy, a little bit anxious potentially about doing, you know, bigger things that they have done in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I help them, it's called Mapping Your Mastery, and I help them understand themselves. You know, it's not about you have to do this, you have to do that. It's really about honing in on what's in the person's heart, taking them out of their comfort zone in a way that allows them to know themselves better, know their strength better, and to have them identify what exactly it is that they want to achieve with their life. Mm -hmm. And then we structure an action plan to get them to, you know, go and actually do the plan that they want with their life. But just going back on, on what you said about the circumstances, circumstances in the world are totally neutral. Like Mm -hmm. even, even the fact that there is a virus out there right now, that's a neutral circumstance. It's not until we apply our brains and our thoughts to those circumstances that we create anything about it. So Mm -hmm. we interpret that as bad. Like if you, if you don't get the virus, it's, it's still kind of neutral. It's, it's a thing to be, cautious about Mm -hmm. but it's it's still a neutral fact like it's a thing that's happening in the world just like ebola yeah you know it's it's like i don't want it but it's it's a neutral fact and we don't have to be worried about it we can be aware of it but we don't have to sort of allow it to leak our energy from us Mm -hmm. because the result of leaking our energy is that we don't have time and we don't have energy to do the things that will move our reality forward. So we really are in control of our response based on how we're thinking about things. And I would really urge people to start thinking that, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that you're going to be affected by this, especially if you're young. Like if you're, if you're older, it it seems like the, the, uh, the data shows that older people are, are more, at risk within this uh, situation but if you're young and even if you get it you're probably going to be okay so Mm -hmm. i I wouldn't worry so much um like to 
take all the precautions. Don't be around the vulnerable people and um, like wash your hands, do all that sort of stuff like is really important. But, you know, get on with your life. Get on, do do things that empower you. Now is a really great opportunity, actually, to start learning skills, to read about interesting things. Maybe there's a project that you've been putting off for a long time that you can go mm. and look at now. Like exactly, that's that's the way I'd be thinking about it. Look at it in a positive light as an opportunity, rather than something to be fearful and and cowering in the corner. Oh, what am I going to do? Or working online, also. I mean, maybe the economy and uh, and all some of the paradigms things that we are used to to work with i mean we have to work online there's no other <laughs> formula these days for sure and this is this is an amazing time because so many people now are working from home they are um being told by their employers to set up stall at home yeah and this this is also a great opportunity for people to start thinking about negotiating their role with their mm. employer you know if if this works out <clears throat> Why not maybe do half of your week at home? Would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Okay. Well, Rob, let's change a little bit of topic or let's move. Let's dig in the, the libertarian or liberty ideas. Um, first of all, I would like that if you can correlate this coaching uh, mindset, empowerment, things that we've been talking so far with liber uh, liberal or libertarianism, what are the connections that you see? Because sometimes there's a disconnection between personal values and political mm -hmm. values. And I think, to my, I mean, at least that's my opinion, that these are uh, linked uh, in some way or another. For sure they're linked. Like, it takes you to realize what is happening in the exterior to reflect upon what is happening up here. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening here and what is happening outside in terms of our own personal liberty and our own sense of where liberty comes from, they're inextricably linked. Like if we don't, if, if we're not free within ourselves, we can't really expect the outside world to, you know, look free because mm -hmm. we don't know what freedom looks like. So I think most people that are, on the liberal libertarian side have a sense of w wanting something free about themselves, achieving that and then expecting it on the outside world. So it wasn't until I had had my sort of accident and, mm -hmm. and reflected on these things that I found that whole libertarian ideas. I, I started to read uh, Murray Rothbard and, and Hayek mm -hmm. and Mises I think it was Ron Paul's um, 20... 12? No, 2008 campaign that sort of mm. got me aware of, of, of the whole libertarian movement. And from there, I was kind of like... I was down the rabbit hole, basically, looking at all these different things. And then I read um, Murray Rothbard's book, uh, For a New Liberty, and I just loved that. I just was like, that actually explains how we can have a full free society without the a state without sort of a coercive centralized government mm -hmm. system <clears throat> forcing everybody to to do do things and that just it spoke to me on a personal level because you know any sense of coercion internally where i'm forcing myself to to do something is is a reflection on the outside of a government you know pointing guns to say people you go and do that you know, when we're forcing ourselves to do things that we don't want to do, mm -hmm. we're not really giving ourselves that sense of freedom and liberty for ourselves. So that, that was my journey. Um, once I'd really read that, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of an ANCAP now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that was... And, mm -hmm. and to be honest, I'm not really too much of a academic scholar when it comes to reading lots of the libertarian literature. Yeah. Um, I've I, I've read that it really hit me in 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 and it spoke to me. I I, I don't think you have to go digging further unless you're really into it and you want to you want to change public policy. Yeah. I'm not really about changing public policy to be honest. I think that's a whole no. It's not for me. There's there's many more interested 
uh, smarter people that are interested in that. And mm-hmm. <laughs> great, great that they exist, but uh, it's not but, for me. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, I don't know if you have this feeling with your clients and so on. These libertarian ideas are not so popular because talking about uh, free markets and limited government, sometimes it sounds like a little bit strange. People <clears throat> doesn't seem to understand it or... <clears throat> excuse me, they think that, uh, I don't know, there's no solidarity or empathy in this kind of uh, society that we are um, imaginating or thinking about. How do you respond to those critics or maybe amongst your clients, maybe because I have some coach, uh, clients that are coach, that some of their clients are uh, usually left-leaning. I don't know why. I don't know if, it, if this happens to you, Rob. First of all, I would never bring a political discussion into the coaching conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I would talk about personal freedom. I would never talk about a political... I'd never engage in that. Like I think that that is kind of entrepreneurial suicide in many cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, because, yeah, you're right. A lot of people reject these ideas because... Well, let me ask you the question. What was your first sense of the ideas of liberty? Like if I was to say um, in a year we're going to have no government, Mm -hmm. before you were a libertarian, how would that have made you feel? Um, Chaos. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that's where people go, right, in their mind. It's like, I do not want that. You're a dangerous person for even – trying to think about that that's Mm -hmm. that's terrible how dare you and i get it i get it because that fear response is an evolutionary obviously it's maladaptive now um but people go into a fear response straight away and they're just like they go into that fight or flight they want to be like this guy is crazy get me out of here or they want to fight you Mm -hmm. and that that makes sense that a lot of people will react that way. They'll look at you and as a dangerous person. But if you can explain it in terms of where they are in their life and how it applies to them, I found that that is much easier to be able to explain the, the ideas of liberty. So mm-hmm. if you find one thing where they feel unfree and try to metaphorically use the problem thing as the government, mm-hmm. usually they can, they can recognize that when the government goes away the problem that they have internally there's a sense of freedom Mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of how i try to um explain the ideas of freedom so if somebody has a a problem where it's maybe a relationship and we explain that the, the the problem in the relationship is the government that's that's how I, I metaphorically get around mm-hmm. fear around it. But I never do it in a coaching context. Mm-hmm. And I very rarely even engage in those types of conversations anymore because Me neither. <laughs> they're usually just toxic. I, there's this very specific thing that needs to happen for me in a conversation with somebody new for me to even attempt to, to engage them. Um, they have to show me that they're not emotionally volatile. And they have to show me that they can actually uh, process complex ideas. <laughs> so if they don't, if they don't have those two ingredients, I'll um, hmm. I won't be talking about freedom and liberty. Absolutely. Well, if you let me add the comment, sometimes the problem that I find amongst people that have different political uh, uh, leaning visions than I is this imposition of preferences. You know, and I don't mind if you are conservative or or liber- or or democrat or 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 progressive, excuse me, Mm. because people tend to think that, no, we should ban marijuana because I don't like it, or we should ban gay marriage because I don't like it. Is there any way, I know it's a complex question, but is there any way to fight against that kind of bias? So if I have fear inside of me, talking about psychology and and coaching, um, sometimes the persons have the incentive to impose those, those fear on onto the others. I don't know if you agree with this uh, reflection. So how do you, like this is, this is kind of like the electric fence and the cow, right? Mm-hmm. When, you, when you go too close to the fence, you get a shock, right? And the person gets a shock when you 
trigger their electric fence. Yeah. So, so what I do, like taking that they are not emotionally volatile and they're able to engage in conversation, I'm all about just pouring love on them, really empathizing and understanding what their concern is and hearing it and making them feel that that I know exactly what they mean when they when they have the fear because people close down if they don't feel heard and a sense that you can hold a space for them to hear where they're coming from because their fears are really they're real for them their perception mm-hmm. is that <clears throat> You know, if you want people to be taking drugs, you want obviously people dying in the street. In the street, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's their their brain is giving them a horror story, and you're coming in with this. And if you if you give them the sense that you're just steamroller steamrolling over their uh, perception, they won't like you. But if you can hold their perception and and you know speak to it and show them that their perception might not necessarily be actually correct and offer them a moment of revision. If you can offer them sort of a different idea, a room to even conceptualize a different idea Mm. and to show them that you actually care about them and that their perception is worth revising because of your idea. And then you've got a moment of pause where they don't actually, um, feel aggressive against what Mm -hmm. you've offered them usually that that works for me and you mightn't convince somebody on them on the spot but you leave them with a seed that will grow over time Mm -hmm. because i don't believe that you can just flick your fingers and and change someone's minds you just have (laughs) like i view all of this as sprinkling lots of seeds that eventually will grow Mm -hmm. if you sprinkle enough and if you do it well. And if you do it well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rob, my last question. I would like to link more or less all the topics that we have been talking. And in this case, I would like to link the, or, or the correlation that I see uh, between uh, personal growth and also capitalism. Because we can be talking about personal growth and living the life that you want to live and fulfillment, etc. But you, if you lived in a fucked up country in uh, Africa, for instance, you might not have the possibility uh, to have that. So the question in this case is, um, these ideas that we stand for, classical liberalism, um, limited, limited government, um, capitalism, of course, um, are related with living a, 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 a more fulfilled life? I didn't catch the question there. Oh, excuse me. So uh, do you think that uh, we need, I mean, these political ideas are Mm. a prerequisite in order to to live a a life that's worth living? Because um, uh, maybe if if the environment, Mm. um, I don't know, let's say that you live under a a communist uh, regime, maybe you cannot have apply all those uh, coaching ideas that that we have been talking before. Sure. So, Obviously, you know, the the ideas of freedom thrive better in, in societies like we live in, liberal democracies, mm. where the ideas can proliferate and, there, you know, you can use your own initiatives to, mm, exactly. to, to get people on board. But, you know, the, the, the freedom starts within the heart of the person. So if you're a human being and you're breathing air and you've got a cognition and you have that desire to be free, you can still change the world, your world, and that can influence other people. And that's where the start of freedom comes from. It, it starts here with an idea that, that is, is your passion you know, puts that out into the world. So even if you live in a, a communist dictatorship, I know libertarians in China. I know libertarians wow. in, in, in Africa. And they're doing, they're doing uh, freedom in, in the best way that they can. Hmm. In some cases, it's to get themselves out of that situation so that they can thrive uh, elsewhere. But you can still embrace the ideas of freedom and 
I would even say that the tendency to be free once you have these ideas in those types of uh, environments is even more strong within mm. you because Makes sense. You know, if, if you see it right in front of you, mm. you'll want to do something about it because you're seeing your brothers and sisters and your friends and, and family suffer. And if you know about these ideas, you'll want to do something about it. So, mm. you know, yeah, it's, it's mm. absolutely true that you, you can do more where we, where we are right now, but it's not to say that it can't be done there. Yeah. It's, mm. It's impossible. It's fucked up. I wouldn't wish it on on anybody in the world to be living under uh, a horrendous dictatorship like that. But you can never kill the spirit of freedom. You can never kill that. And that's what's beautiful. Oh my God. That, that gave me thrills. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. The last question, um, I always end up the, the interviews in the same way. It's all, um, also a personal question. Is that if you can give some advice to some um, viewer or listener that might have a, a similar profile than yours. Let's say I'm a coach or I want to learn this, uh, this discipline and also I am starting to be a libertarian leaning. Uh, what advice can you give to, to your young self or someone that has a, uh, a similar profile? Yeah. Uh, like for me, it's, it's, it's the question of, of being yourself. For years, I wasn't being myself. And if I could go back to that 21-year-old me, I would really urge myself to just be myself more and know myself more. Mm -hmm. So doing that introspection like the, the the greatest thing that i've started to do over the years was to write my thoughts down to physically write my thoughts down oh. about what was going on up here because a lot of the time people are not aware of what is going on up here hmm. and it, that sabotages them because they they are unconscious about the automatic programming and conditioning that they've picked up and it's normal i think that the way that I think is just, it's normal, mm -hmm. but that normal might be really self-sabotaging and against the person's own self-interest. Who wants so, to be normal, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people do. They want to fit in and they want to not, not rock the boat because, you know, if you, if you stand out, that can be like isolating. So for a lot of people, that's, that raises a lot of fear mm -hmm. but again i view that fear as an opportunity and something that we should race towards so mm -hmm. that's 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 what i would say know yourself more and step out of that fucking comfort zone and also you said that writing actually helps you to frame your mind yeah the more you know about actually what's going on the more you can recognize actually i don't really want to think that i'm going to change the way i think And that gives you an opportunity to say, well, how do I want to think instead? And that's an infinite potential sort of place to, to, to decide, mm -hmm. do you know what? I want to think that I'm going to impact millions of people one day. <clears throat> And that's, that's really what leadership's about, is saying, I'm going to take a stand on something I believe in strongly, and I'm going to help people understand why this is important. I, I know I said it was the last question, but uh, you touched a very interesting point, um, and that's the last one. How can we identify that? Uh, it's a hard one, too, by the way. How can we <laughs> identify uh, uh, bullshit uh, amongst uh, coachings? Because I, I see many oh, coaches that I think uh, they know the technique, they know that fear and anxiety is a great tool, but instead of helping them, they kind of fit the, the anxiety of their clients in order to continue <laughs> to make them pay them uh, even more. So is there any trick or any signal that makes you feel like, oh, okay, this guy is bullshitting me or something like that? Oh, God, that's such a great question. And you're going to make me make a lot of enemies now. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, like I, I do see quite a lot of charlatans in this industry, and it makes me cringe. I'm like, oh my god, don't don't be saying that sort of stuff. Oh, and to me, yeah, there's like some of it is aesthetic. Like for me, I'm not so much about the ethereal new age kind of let's read our tarot card sort of stuff. I think that that is a lot of garbage. <laughs> I'm, I, I really work on the tangible of what is happening here mm-hmm. and trying to help people attune their heart and their mind together to really understand how to get themselves out of themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's the way I work. A lot of the, like I'm not saying that people shouldn't work with people, but like whatever works for you, whatever hits you in the fields mm-hmm. you should work with but there are people out there that are promising a lot and not giving a lot i know that my program financial freedom for example yeah, they always like, have this <laughs> but again you know a lot of that is marketing a lot of that yeah. is marketing and you know we all market you know i my my tagline is become unstoppable so i help people become unstoppable now that's mm-hmm. that's an idea that everybody can subjectively define themselves mm-hmm. the, when you sort of guarantee a result of achieve financial freedom. Sure. A lot of, a lot of coaches can help you use techniques to achieve financial freedom. But if, if they're guaranteeing those results, it can be problematic. And a lot of the responsibility is always on the client, <laughs> but yeah, the, the coaching industry is, is full of charlatans and uh, a lot of it is kind of, for me, oh, yeah, sometimes I'm a little bit cringe. I don't like to be known as a coach. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, coaching, I think, is so undervalued. I don't think a lot of people understand the needs. Like, it wasn't until I got involved in in, in getting my own uh, psychological interventions that I understood the power of having somebody compassionate to just hold a space for me and what was alive for me. Um, Because we, uh, you know, human beings don't give themselves so much time to, to be alone. We've got like these phones and computers and shiny objects in the world to distract us away from ourselves. And Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know themselves because they don't tune in to their own TV station often enough to be able to know what is going on. And that's, that's why I think coaching is incredibly, empowered, mm-hmm. uh, incredibly powerful. But there are people out there that are wanting to, to, um, to sell you with not very good products. And mm-hmm. so, so one way to look at that is to understand, to really dig in. If you're having a conversation with a coach, ask them about their own sense of progress and how they've overcome and processed their own traumas in their own lives. That's a good way to, to discover the shysters from the, the actual valuable ones. Okay. Well, Rob, I encourage you to continue doing your, your great job, uh, your great work, excuse me making people unstoppable in your program. I will leave the, the links of your, um, yeah, how can they contact you in the description? And I don't know, thanks for your time. I think we have been talking for 50 minutes or something like that. Oh my God. But it's been really interesting. And also I can honestly tell you that uh, I kind of needed to hear some of your words. So thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me on today. And thank you for doing what you're doing as well. Spreading some good words around your community. Awesome. Okay. We need, we need people like us out there. Exactly. Okay, Rob, Duffy, thanks for your time again. Thanks for, uh, uh, for the viewers. Uh, leave a like and subscribe. And you know, this is YouTube. You have to do it. It's mandatory. But also the most important thing is that I hope you take uh, Rob's words in consideration because we have to be confined for almost a month. So there's no excuses, right? <laughs> okay, Rob, uh, thanks again and see you very soon. Bye.